<clears throat> so good afternoon to everybody joining us at home for another um, Liverpool Mipham webinar and um, I think this is our, our fourth or fifth in the series so whether this is your first one or you've been through it all, again, thank you for joining us. Um, today we've got another another great panel, which Stephen will introduce to you in a second. But before we get going, I'm just going to go through some um, some housekeeping. So as per usual, we can't hear or see you. Um, but if you would like to chat to our panellists or ask a question, you can do so via the Q&A function or the chat feature. Um, both should be available and ready to use. Um, so you can ask our panellists whatever you like through throughout the hour. Um, we will be running until 3.30, um, so there's plenty of opportunity to do so. Um, but if you do need to leave early for any reason, you can find a recording of the webinar, um, which will be available tomorrow on the Invest Liverpool website. Um, and it will also go in an email after, after this. So without further ado, I will pass you over to Stephen, who will introduce our panellists for today. Thanks very much, Stefan, and uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Stephen Cowperthwaite, uh, Principal and Managing Director of Avis and Young Liverpool, but also Chair of the Liverpool Midland Steering Group. So I'm delighted to introduce the latest in our series of Liverpool MIPIM webinars. And I think we've got a fairly uh, humdinger of a session ahead of us today with a fantastic lineup of speakers. So before we start, a word about Liverpool at MIPIM. Um, we, we've adopted a collective approach with our partners to discuss key issues that affect the property sector. But I think importantly, it's also to give a voice to the sector to ensure that we are con contributing to the local, regional and national discussions about recovery, which is particularly apt today with the Chancellor's latest announcement. It's also about fostering new ways of thinking and collaboration between public and private sectors. Our theme for today, the opportunity for investment, how the investment market has changed and our quality panel, I think fairly reflects these ambitions that we have as a, as, a, as a delegation and as a, a partnership. So without any further words from myself, I'm delighted to uh, bring Sam McClary, who is editor of Estates Gazette, uh, to introduce the panel. Uh, I'll go off screen and leave, leave them to have a fantastic conversation, I'm sure. So over to you, Sam. Thanks, Stephen, and, and how everyone who is uh, logged on. Thank you so much for joining us today for for what is going to be a very interesting uh, conversation. Um, before we get into that though, I am uh, going to allow our panellists to introduce themselves and what I always like to do with a, with a little introduction is just, um, you know, um, the old blind date, who you, who you are, where you come from, and then uh, just what, um, what you're hoping to bring to the conversation today. Uh, and I'm going to start, Shannon, with you. Don't forget to unmute. I think I'm unmuted. Um, <laughs> everybody. My name is Shannon Conway. I work for Glenbrook Property. We're developers. My role there is residential director. Um, for me, I, my speciality obviously is residential. We work with an awful lot of institutional funds and housing associations. And it's really just to discuss Liverpool as an investment prospect, um, why I believe there's plenty of room there for growth, um, why COVID is maybe a catalyst and, and can, can bring Liverpool forward uh, through, through COVID. So <laughs> that's me. Brilliant, thanks Shannon. Gavin, I'm gonna pass next to you. Hi Sam and uh, hi to everyone attending. I'm Gavin Winbanks, I'm Director for Capital Investment and entrepreneurship at the Department for International Trade. You might remember me from some of my earlier performances at MIPM. So I head up <laughs> the UK Government Pavilion uh, and, uh, and at the moment uh, doing a significant amount of work on the development of a new investment strategy. And so I'm delighted to be able to have the opportunity to um, speak uh, A, with the panel today, but also um, uh, engage uh, with uh, with people in Liverpool, particularly because uh, levelling up and the regional economies are going to be absolutely critical to the success of what we're trying to achieve in terms of the investment strategy. So thanks for the invitation uh, today. Great. Thanks, Gavin. Mark, over to you. 
Thanks, Sam. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Mark Bousfield. I'm the Director of Commercial Development and Investment for the Liverpool City Region Combined Authority. So I have the privilege of investing the public money we receive from government into economic development, be it housing skills, infrastructure, um, land and property, anything else. I uh, will offer you a couple of insights into how we think the economy is running and what our opportunities are into our priorities from a public investment point of view. And of course, as usual, I'll be listening. Thank you. Thanks, Mark. And last but by no means least, Matt. Thanks, Sam. Good afternoon. Yeah, my name is Matt Oakley. I uh, work in the commercial property research team at Savills and spend almost my entire life uh, working with investors and uh, businesses, helping them to decide where in the UK they should locate and invest. So I'm hoping to end this call uh, uh, with a lot more persuasive reasons for them to put their money into Liverpool going forward. Fantastic. Thank you, everyone. And um, let's start with um, maybe a bit around that persuasiveness. So the, the title of today's event is The Opportunities for Investment, How the Market Has Changed. And I think it, it's fair to say that a lot has changed over the last uh, six months or so. So I thought it'd be quite fun if we flip um, the, the conversation uh, a little bit um, to start off with and say, um, why, why aren't people seizing on the opportunities to invest in, in Liverpool? What is it? What are the reasons that, are, that might be keeping them away and because he's never shy of being controversial Matt I'm gonna I'm gonna ask you first to uh to have a go at answering that um I think you know despite the fact that um, um Liverpudlians are a very proud group of people of being Liverpudlians I don't think Liverpool has ever shouted loud enough about what it is what it stands for um, it's, it's, a, it's a weird mix of, of tremendous confidence in the city and the culture. Uh, but actually, when you look at it in the cold, hard sort of stats I look at, there has never really been a lot of institutional quality property to buy there. Um, so just a lack of stuff to buy. Um, you know, I probably shouldn't mention Manchester on a, on a Liverpool call, but, you know, Manchester has never been shy about selling itself hard on the global stage. Yet when I look at comparators between the two cities in terms of things that weirdly matter to branding, you know, having a strong global football team, you know, high presence in media, you know, they should be batting um, at a similar level, but haven't. So I think, you know, there is a confidence issue. Obviously there are some, some things from the past um, that have been an issue and it was it was on a fabulous EG event many years ago that I shared uh, a platform with Derek Hatton um, and you know he, he was very open he said like you know the biggest mistake we made was not becoming a greater Liverpool at the same time as Manchester became a greater Manchester um, so I think you know it's great to see people like Mark um, leading the city you know the city going forward as well and, and it really feels like it's coming together and there's some real opportunities going forward. Mark, do you feel confident? Are you ready to shout and be greater Liverpool? Yeah, I do. Yeah, yes, I do. I feel supremely confident. I'm going to, I'm, I'm going to, I feel supremely confident because I think we know exactly what we're good at now. So even two, three years ago, we wouldn't shout from the rooftops that we have a global health institution with a half billion pound portfolio, research portfolio from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. But the Liverpool School of Tropical Medicine is there. It employs 700 people. Most of them appear to have a PhD and has a global impact. The, the, the high performance computing that we've just rolled out of the University of Liverpool and into a health and social care cooperative product appears to be the blueprint for integrating health and social care data across the country now, as far as I can see from the last two months developments. And we say the same about Unilever. So one of the things that we're working on, on the public sector side really strongly is um, the National Packaging Innovation Centre, which is about taking a one trillion pound packaging market and seeing ways to make it sustainable. And within three months, we've had 
10 Forty 100 companies, AstraZeneca, Tesco, Unilever, P&G, Mondelez, and a load of international companies saying, if you do, it will definitely come. So I think we're much, much better at going straight on to the, this is what we're good at, this is what we're going to keep being good at, and this is why it matters, footprint. Um, and it's starting to trickle through the numbers, I think. Thank you. G Gavin, um, Matt mentioned there um, that Liverpool isn't Manchester. Manchester, we know, has been very good at wooing the international investors. From what Mark has just told us, Liverpool should absolutely be wooing international inv investors too with, with um, the growth opportunities that it has. From your, from your perspective, from the seat that you sit in, are international investors asking the questions about Liverpool? Are you, are you seeing them being wooed? Are they feeling confident in, in Liverpool as an investment hub? So, um, thanks, Sam. I think, uh, so the work that we do in kind of engaging regionally, uh, so the team kind of sources and identifies uh, projects across the UK. Um, Liverpool is a market where we've always been active. And the counterbalance to that is a team of uh, people in 25 different countries around the world where we kind of source and identify uh, investment. I think um, probably picking up a couple of points um, uh, from previous panellists is one is like being kind of laser-like on articulating what the offer is um, and also not trying to kind of um, the, the what is of interest to the institutional investors will be, uh, will be finite um, and not necessarily going out with like a, a, a package of 10 different opportunities but actually being being really confident in some of the uh some of the uh, uh projects that were just mentioned and taking them consistently and having a clear engagement plan on how you're going to do the follow-up and the engagement with the international investors either in their home market and trying to encourage them into the uk so i think um uh, there is an interest. Uh, we've, we've had many delegations that have kind of come from uh, abroad into Liverpool. I think one of the things that kind of central government has to do more to support people in Liverpool uh, uh, in doing is making sure that that kind of investor journey is really clear and consistent. And just as the messaging around uh, what we're trying to achieve and how the quality of the offer is kind of the tenacity with which we approach the investor engagement to make sure that we kind of see, see through things through as we generate interest in the international market. So do less things better and be more confident and ambitious in the way in which we chase them. Fantastic. Thank you. And, and Shannon, for, for you, um, what do you see as, as some of the opportunities in, in Liverpool and, and, and maybe some of the, the misunderstandings that people have around Liverpool, particularly those investors? Um, the, fir the, the first thing I'd probably like to say is that in Liverpool, the Keel, which is the built rent scheme that we delivered uh, down the waterfront, was actually the first forward funded PRS or built to rent apartment um, scheme in the whole of the UK. So I think that's <laughs> one positive, and that was back in 2014 that that deal was agreed. And at the time, it was quite difficult to attract institutional funding um, to, to that scheme, but, but the, the fund that went for it, which was Moorfield, did very, very well when it stabilised and was sold to another investor. Um, so the, I suppose the, um, the, the risk, if you'd call it, the, um, the perceived risk in Liverpool certainly paid off for them. I think one of the things that we've found over, over the years is when we talk to investors about Liverpool, there's some, by the way, who absolutely love it and see all the potential in there. The ones that shy away will normally always go back to graduate retention or jobs. But as Marx said today, there are plenty of um, interesting jobs. There's plenty of graduates who are living and working in Liverpool. But we forget about the whole M62 corridor and also Manchester. And I think it, it's very much, we can't separate Liverpool and Manchester because when we're talking about living and working, you know, if you have lived in London, you know, to travel across London for an hour or an hour and a half, um, you know, people do it. It's not out of the ordinary. Well, it's 45 minute commute from Liverpool to Manchester. So we need to stop separating ourselves. Um, 
and especially now, I think with, with COVID and flexible working and you having the opportunity to, to, to live somewhere and travel a couple of times a week, all of a sudden we become more connected and you have more choice of where you want to live. And that's not just Liverpool, that's a lot of places around the UK. We're, we're seeing that trend. So for me, and I think we'll talk later about it, I think Liverpool has always been of interest to some investors. Others have just gone for the perceived safe option, which is you Leeds, you, um, well, it's, it's always the same Leeds, Birmingham, Manchester, Bristol, um, because it's perceived safe. And if you're new to the sector, um, especially during COVID, we've seen a lot of institutional investors who would traditionally invest in commercial assets, offices, uh, retail, industrial, looking now to residential with no experience whatsoever. Um, we're meeting a lot of them because we've obviously been doing this for a very long time. We've got a track record for delivery, but they are just reading the press or listening to hear same thing in Manchester, Leeds, Birmingham, and you almost have to talk them into some of the secondary cities. Um, but at the moment, actually, that it, it's not so difficult to persuade people. I think that's something that, that COVID has brought through is, 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 is a real opportunity for some of the cities that aren't in those those four traditional regional locations. I think one of the other things that, that COVID has, has brought um, to us is um, there's a lot of chat about cities now, isn't there? And a lot of um, uh, talk around potentially people wanting to move out of cities, you know, will offices survive in cities? Are we all going to move move out i think you know we we uh, ran a quote yesterday with people talking for london anyway about there being a donut whether it's uh, i think they meant a ring donut not a jam donut um, so we'll, we'll go with the ring donut analogy but there's there's a lot that cities still have to offer isn't there and there's perhaps more that the regional cities can offer in a post covid world and and have an opportunity to leave leave london behind dare, dare i say it but for, for Liverpool, how is it going to make sure that it seizes on that opportunity, I suppose, and gets the language right around it being a city that people should want to live, work and play in? I, I, to be honest, I'd just say go and see it. I think <laughs> it's, Liverpool is an incredibly beautiful city. There's a lot of talk during all this time about the 15-minute city and Paris has been used as an example and it's certainly something when we're looking at locations um, for our funding clients, we are, we've always looked at sort of walk scores and being close to amenities or transport links. If you went to, to Liverpool, if we just talk about the city centre for now, but the same is true of the, the suburbs as well, you know, you, the sun rises behind the cathedrals, it sets on the Mersey, you've got virtually the whole city centre is pedestrianised when other city centres are scrambling to find some way to pedestrianise their city centres. Well, the work that Grosvenor did on Liverpool One, creating a huge city park, it's way above other cities. It's already got it all. It's got the cultural aspects. It's got, you know, the Tate, all the museums. It's well connected, um, you know, on the main line routes, but also internally with the Mersey Rail Network. It's already got it all where other cities are trying to become COVID friendly and create this perfect live work balance and bringing people and residents in the city centre. It's done. The groundwork's done. So I'd say anybody who comes to Liverpool can see that, you know, it's, it's, um, it, it just speaks for itself. Thanks, Shannon. Mark, you were nodding along there. Well, of course I was nodding <laughs> along. It's beautiful. It's beautiful. <laughs> it was. Um, I'm get, I, I, Mark, do you want to go first? And then I've got, I've got a couple of bits to add. That I've, I'll... No, you go ahead. No, I, I was just, I was lost in the poetry. Yeah, quite. <laughs> I mean, I found myself wandering down towards the Mersey at a certain point. Um, this one's dead easy, right? Um, if you talk to anybody under the age of 35 odd, it's, it's, it's obvious to them that Liverpool is the, if not amongst the, um, most exciting cities in the UK. Prior to COVID, we had the first, the third and the fourth most visited museum outside of London. With things like the International Wind Factory and the, the, kind of the, the, the counterculture that Liverpool's always been famous for, this, this just sells itself to a certain demographic. 
but perhaps not as well as it could to a demographic of boardroom occupiers uh, above a certain age. And, and that's a challenge we've all got to take on. But, but for the people who actually want to live here, it sells itself. <clears throat> and I think it gives an investment opportunity because as somebody who's been recently looking myself and looking at the numbers, in fact, we have far too few high quality family living opportunities relative to the, relative to the size of our ever growing knowledge intensive, highly educated um, resident base. <clears throat> and that applies both outside the city centre, so opportunities in that, in that northwest corridor around um, St Helens, South, South, South Knowsley, around the Warrington area, that all of that out of our patch, as well as that really well thought through urban living that the Keel was the first good example of. And I'm not surprised that the Keel let, was let well let and well traded because it's set a quality standard and there's definitely space for more of that. Can I, can I pick up on, on a point because I think, I think Shannon absolutely nailed it when she was talking about it, which was, you know, she used the word risk. Um, and, you know, at the moment, um, you know, Liverpool is perceived as being more risky than some of the, the more established centres. Whether that is rational or not doesn't really matter. Um, and equally, if you can get a better return, as, 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 uh, as Moorfield did, um, great, that justifies the risk. I think the challenge for the next 12, 18 months is the UK and indeed the world is in a period of maximum risk aversion. And I would say I don't talk mm. to a single private or institutional investor who isn't doing anything other than pivoting away from risk and towards core, safe, boring. Um, and, uh, you know, that is what always happens coming out of a recession. And it's it, suddenly it's a hell of a lot easier to justify going back to those well-traveled grounds and whether it's the capital city or the second city it actually makes, it's going to make Liverpool's sale, you know, selling Liverpool an awful lot harder going forward. So I think it's focusing on, well, okay, investors, what do they want? What do they perceive as low risk? Has Liverpool got it? And I think, you know, from what Mark was saying earlier, it sounds like there's a credible story here because, you know, Sam, you, you must have written more editorials on beds, sheds and meds in the last sort of, you know, couple of years than anything else. You know, everyone, that's what they perceive as low risk, maybe a bit of core CPD offices. That's where the money wants to go. Um, and it's going to be a question of have you got the stock for them to buy? Nothing more than that, I think. Uh, but I think we've got to be real that, you know, people are not going to take a risk. And I think it's true when you get back to individual personal decisions, you know. You know, the British population is not footloose like the Americans. They don't up sticks and move house um, just because of, you know, COVID, you know, a move to the other side of the country. Um, so I don't think there's going to be a flood of, of people moving, though I'm feeling quite bitter about it because one of my team, the Liverpudlians, just decided he wants to go back to Liverpool. Uh, so uh, I was probably a bad week to ask me to promote Liverpool. <laughs> Can I come back on that? Because I think you make a... I think we're really getting into it now. And I think you make a great point about labor mobility, right? So I, I think a lot of national decisions are made with this assumption that people will move. If you put enough infrastructure around London, people will move. And that, I don't think that's our lived experience in Northern cities. People stay because they've got family connections. People stay because they've got a sense of civic belonging. And so it's just, it's its own argument for me for leveling up. Like you are not going to convince people to, to, to move on mass south. So provide the infrastructure in the north because they will be just as productive as anyone else. It's so true. It's about stopping people leaving, not encouraging people to move. And I've seen so many cities take their eye off that ball and chase that one, you know, Gavin's yep. there with, with this amazing trophy bit of investment. And you know, everyone chases after that and they take their eye off their local businesses and their local communities. And suddenly the city is not as good as it was. But, but that in itself, sorry, I'm going to make a slightly political point. That's the argument for devolution, right? That's the argument for regional investment and devolution. Gavin? So 
I'm, um, uh, I, so I'm trying to <laughs> avoid as many bear traps as I possibly can. Uh, but I, what I would say is I think it all has to be pushing in the same direction. And I don't think any one of these interventions in isolation is going to have, like, um, kind of fixing, uh, yeah. fixing devolution or um, encouraging people to stay locally um, doesn't get people over their risk aversion. So having a really coherent articulation of the vision for the city, uh, as has been done in some of the documents uh, that uh, that have been produced, as well as a local industrial strategy, so people understand the totality of the offer, um, as well as making sure that it is a, a, a great place in which to live and work, are absolutely fundamental. And if they're all pushing in the right direction, you get the right outcome. If one of those falls down, it's suboptimal. Um, and so I think that's something uh, that there is no one policy solution that will fix any of this. It all has to be done in in kind of partnership and, and coordination. So um, uh, I would, we're kind of, one of the things that kind of has come to mind is like around the Liverpool tropical um, disease work, we're hearing from a whole heap of institutional investors who are looking into life sciences for the first time in a long time. Are we doing enough to sell that? So um, are we kind of articulating that? Is the local industrial strategy, I know that there's a reference for health, how we, are we making all of the messages around Liverpool coherent to kind of match up with people's lived experience and the passion that we heard from Shannon, which is, uh, which is clearly um, uh, a, a very real experience. I think that's a that's an issue not just for Liverpool, isn't it? That's so that coherent message from 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 cities, from city regions, probably from the UK as a yeah. as a as a whole. So, and and I guess that's part of the um, you know why we still need to persuade people that that Liverpool is is a great place to to invest and. Um, uh, and it, it stuck in my head um, from you, Matt, saying, you know, you've, you've got to be um, safe and boring, but it seems like Liverpool is anything but, but boring. So how is it going to really work hard for its, its current um, occupants to make them um, feel that they want to continue to invest in, in the city and the, and the region too, and to uh, those who are you know, have plenty of money to, to play with at the moment, but don't know where to put it in a very um, risk averse, as you've said, Matt. Shannon, any thoughts from you, poetically? Yes, yes. So I think in terms of risk, I, I it was quite careful to say perceived risk, because <laughs> the, the, first of all, I suppose during COVID, I, I mentioned you've got this um, view that retail office assets are, are starting to become more risky and residential is seeing as a, as a more safe and boring option. We saw it during a financial crash. It was residential that, you know, held the, the letting side of things that, that stayed secure. And during COVID, we've seen that tenant return and um, rental payment has outperformed any of the other sectors, which is obviously why people are now moving to residential as a more safe and boring um, option. And we're seeing interest our institutional investors now are coming from Scandinavia, from the States, from Germany, all looking into the UK. The other sort of safe and boring thing is the second, they call the secondary cities, the more regional cities, because they haven't had um, substantial growth in the bill to rent sector. So Manchester, for example, 26,000 um, bill to rent units, which personally, by the way, I, I do not think is oversupply. I think we're at a renaissance period with our rental market. If I went to the States in 2015 and it was like being smacked around the face of the fish, it's suddenly a light bulb moment of how what we do isn't fit for purpose, our traditional letting system. So I think we're just at the beginning of a renaissance in terms of residential letting, serving the tenants, you know, and giving good quality to them in terms of service and accommodation. So Liverpool is actually a safe bet because if you compare it to some of the other regional cities, it's so far behind. Um, we're talking about a couple of thousand build to rent apartments, not 26,000. So there's so much further to go. So it's a safer bet for some, and this is what we're hearing from our institutional investors, and Manchester. So it's, 
but then you've always got some that'll go Manchester man everyone's going to I'll just follow them <laughs> they must be doing something right I'll go to Manchester as well so I do think that it's a safe bet um picking up on what Mark said about the family housing and um having that type of stock I, I echo that as well I think when you've looked in when you look at to the Liverpool suburbs and further out than that the combined authority in the surrounds we've lacked that I think the last five years we've seen an awful lot more of it coming through but there's still a shortage the traditional housing stock is your terrace housing with a backyard or a 1930s house with a, a small garden um, and yeah some people will just absolutely love new homes as well so we we have we have um struggled with that but there has been a lot more supply in the last five years what we're looking at now again and this is pushed by um our institutional investors and from the housing associations that we work with is building good quality single family rental units in areas and something i'm particularly interested in and looking at is larger schemes and um, sites in the in the suburbs where we've got maybe 10 acres and on there we can do some build to rent um really good quality housing we can do some later living as well and we can do some affordable housing with our rp clients and in the middle have a like a big green where everyone can come together and you bring it in community but it's using the or getting everybody different tenures different ages and using all the people that we work with to actually create these fantastic communities and places to live in in the suburbs so that's the drive actually from all the people that we we work with that's what they're looking for and <laughs> sort of see ourselves as sort of bringing it together and 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 working working that way and that's the type of thing we're looking at doing in the suburbs of all the major cities that we're looking at Great, fantastic. I'm just going to want to say to the audience, thank you for submitting questions. Please do keep doing them and we will, we will turn to some questions um, uh, in not too short a, short a time. Um, I, want to, I want to stick at the moment though with the, the safe bet um, uh, analogy with, with Liverpool. And, and I wonder, you know, Brexit, um, COVID, I've let it back. The cut out the bag. COVID isn't the only problem we're having to deal with. Brexit is looming. Is there an argument, Matt, that um, Liverpool and other regional cities, but Liverpool in, in uh, particular, is a safer bet than London in a, a post-Brexit world or UK? I think if you're looking at the service sector, um, yes, definitely. You know, I'm generally probably see that you know, services in particular, financial services outside London is probably less exposed to Brexit because it's selling stuff to those of us who live in the UK rather than, than cross-border stuff that might be affected. So definitely, I, I I'm, think that is, obviously there are, you know, there are bits of the country that are more dependent on import and export. There are bits of the country that are dependent more on European grants and loans um, than others. Um, but equally, you know, product i still i'm still firmly of a view that you know product is going to need to move in into the country it's going to come in through our ports um, our port capacity has always been pretty poor in the uk it needs to get better um, and you know ports lead to warehouses warehouses lead to you know jobs shops jobs lead to more shops it it's it's a slightly virtuous circle but i think you know the point about you know has the city got the infrastructure to support it, 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 it is a very important one. Um, but also I think, you know, it does come back to, you know, the, the, the industries that may be, you know, are you strong in industries that are not going to be negatively affected by it and, and uh, um, you know, tech, biomed, all that kind of stuff is, is seen as relatively immune, might even get a boost because companies are going to have to run trim track uh, testing. So. I wouldn't say Liverpool stands out there as more defensive, but just generally, I think you know the regional cities could well have a better Brexit than than London, and that's probably as far as I'm going to go before one of my colleagues in London kills me. <laughs> Thanks, Matt. Um, Mark, um, Matt was talking there about some of the some of the industries that 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 might um, 
do a, uh, be a little bit more resilient um, during during Brexit than than others, and, and Liverpool having having some of those. Can you talk to us a little bit about um, sort of some of the innovation um, that is going on in in Liverpool? Um, I know you touched on it a little bit earlier, but if you just dig dig a little bit deeper into into that for us. Yeah, sure. Look, I give some. Can I, can I just follow up on Matt's answer first? So you may. I, I agree with you, Matt. I think <clears throat> so. I think we are relatively well placed. You know, we've we've got we we have quite a lot of automotive, for example. But the challenges with automotive existed long before Brexit and will persist long after Brexit. Uh, and, and and that's about the different models and models and approaches. Um, but we are relatively well placed. So post Panama export. Uh, hitting its business plan in terms of increasing volumes through that port um, and then obviously the link to logistics that you made. Um, high performance computing, uh, materials, material science and materials related innovation, infectious diseases control, three things that we have national nay global strengths in, they're going to do just fine as will the emerging tech industry and, 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 the, and the culture and creative industries once we get past COVID. I would just say though that that my concern for Brexit um, is not to do with property. It's less to do with um, the business ecosystem actually, but it's more to do with the skills agenda. Because one way or another, European social funding has funded skills development in the city region for a long time. And then does need to be a permanent and serious replacement to that funding to help our adult population look into look towards future jobs. And we've got to keep talking about that because it will become no less important as we try and get beyond beyond the structural implications of COVID recovery, of Brexit recovery. I, th I think you'd agree with that, Martin, Martin, Shannon, and Gavin. All nodding. Anyone disagree? Um, but then just to go on, I'll, and I'll, I'll illustrate it for a sense. You know, in, in, so so pivoting pivoting out of Brexit. The one of the one of the things we're doing in St Helens is this the last futures idea. So we're taking the global research and development departments of four or five glass manufacturers who typically don't don't collaborate at all. It's not in their DNA to collaborate, and putting them together with a in a furnace where they can where they can collaborate with with shared or divided IP on on sustainable glass uses, including vials for virus uh, virus vaccines, but including also like data cables and fiber and et cetera, et cetera. And that that again is the kind of post Brexit deeply collaborative knowledge intensive stuff that we're working on really heavily, because it'll drive a globally focused 21st century. That makes sense. It does. Gavin, yeah. anything that, that you want to add around the, the Brexit and Liverpool strength? So I think being able to coherently articulate exactly uh, as Mark just did around uh, what makes Liverpool uniquely different and how uh, 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 how should we be taking that to the global stage or how should we be kind of trying to reinforce it to ensure that it it stays and is nurtured locally in Liverpool so that kind of that example uh, that was just provided was hugely hugely interesting and I think um, the perennial challenge is making sure that um, uh, civil servants like myself back in London are aware of these opportunities um, so that it does get the support that it, it actually needs the bit that um, I usually talk uh, to you, uh, Sam, and colleagues about uh, is the work that we do with the large-scale institutional investors. But another part of my team is attracting like VC and uh, high net worth individuals uh, um, into the UK to support that economic development and to kind of attract and retain uh, um, the innovation that is uh, in places like Liverpool. One of the hardest parts of my job is actually um, uh, trying to source and identify those projects so that we can showcase them to the world. But there is so much talent there. And if, if what we could be doing is kind of supporting uh, uh, companies and ideas and concepts uh, with kind of grant and research funding, as well as sourcing capital to enable those companies to grow, it further adds to the vibrancy of, of Liverpool. 
So do you, does that mean you need um, more people, I suppose, to come knocking on your door and saying, hey, come and look at, us, look, look at us, look at what we, look at what we do, uh, back to that sort of showing off uh, um, part that we started yeah. the conversation around? So I think local industrial strategy is one way of doing it. I've seen the, um, uh, the recovery plan, having a really coherent articulation of what um, the strengths and the capabilities and what local people are prepared to back in order to make sure that it gets the attention. I mean, and the trouble there always is, is that every, every city in the UK uh, um, uh, has a strong and compelling story. Playing to your strengths is the absolute key uh, and making sure that um, it's really honed and articulated well so that we can be um, uh, in supporting it, we can able to kind of take it uh, in, a, in a structured and coherent uh, manner to the world. But yeah, I, I wouldn't be backwards in coming forwards and extolling the virtue of innovation within Liverpool. Thanks. Mark, you've come off mute. That usually means you've got something to say. Not at all. I'm listening. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we have um, we have just uh, we have about twenty minutes left, mm. so I'm going to start um, ploughing through some of the, some of the questions as uh, I want to make sure that everyone gets an opportunity to have their their question answered. Um, the first was was emailed in to us, so I'm going to re read that um, and we'll try and answer that one first. So. Uh, this is um, from someone who said, we have just completed, yes, they well done, uh, Innovate UK funding application for £250,000, uh, which relates to a COVID-19 situation. If we survive the initial round, the results will be announced on 29th of November for a project starting on the 1st of January next year. As a micro company, we will need funding to help cash flow for the first quarter of next year. Innovate UK pay quarterly in arrears. We have partners who will need paying monthly. Other partners like Liverpool University and others will be paid directly. As a company with very little in assets, what would you suggest for them? Um, they're open to any sort of funding and they want to use it as a springboard to other research projects. So very real, real issue there and hopefully something we can provide a real, real solution for. Gavin. So I'm... Oh, paused. He's going to come back. Mark, do you want to try while Gavin is, is paused for us? Yeah, <clears throat> just to say... Um, ah, he's back, but go start, for it. Yeah, start, <clears throat> start by saying congratulations. That sounds really exciting. Follow up by saying, um, as a former banker, I'd need more information on your numbers before I'd be able to recommend what you do there. But if you, if you get in touch, um, we'll try and help. So we have uh, just through the CA, there's, there's a flexible growth fund of, of kind of a very flexible debt that we can offer. There's the British Business Bank backed uh, equity uh, in, investment options around there. We're doing something called the Future Innovation Fund, which is about short sprint, in, like grants for short sprint innovation that can get going during the COVID bubble. So you've probably got four, five, six options, but I need more information. I, okay. uh, um, Sam, if I'm back. Gavin, you're I, back. Uh, Hurrah. Fabulous. Sorry about that. <laughs> I'm on the government Wi Fi. Um, <laughs> so uh, I would uh, um, I would offer exactly the same in, in that we have a team that kind of um, talk to individual companies that are seeking uh, further investment. Uh, and depending on what the stage and scale, if it's not us, there'll be other parts of government that would definitely be interested in. I think kind of um, uh, the work of Innovate UK uh, and, and that program is exemplary. And I think most people do not understand necessarily all the cool things that they are supporting and, and, and backing and all of the supporting ecosystem. Um, so I would hope that if there's anything that we could potentially do, I'd be more than happy to kind of take it up offline separately and try and join some of the dots as Mark has kind of proposed as well. I think that's a, a great offer from the pair of you and I, I really hope that that, uh, that that person asking the question gets gets in touch and um, please do uh, and Gavin and, and Mark will be able to help you out I'm sure. Um, so next up on our questions from um, from our, our listeners uh, today this one I'm gonna I'm gonna direct to you first Shannon um, as it is uh, residential. Uh, Liverpool has a number of high profile failed residential schemes. 
How is this perceived by investors and what impact is it having on the city? Yeah, I thought this question may come up at some point. <laughs> it has had some failed residential schemes, but the structure of those deals um, is completely different than um, build to rent and even um, build to sell. And when I say build to rent, I mean the um, building for an institutional fund or um, a housing association who are, are, are manage, managing that. So it's a, it's a completely different um, model. Um, in terms of speaking to investors, if anything, I suppose looking at the positives really, they're, they're, they're not competition. You know, it's fractional sales um, where they have completed. It's, 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 it's more difficult to manage. So you don't get the quality because you've got multiple landlords in place. So in terms of that, there's no competition at all. So we just discount that really. For an investor, what's important to them is delivery, honesty, transparency. Um, personally, we've, we've done well in, in Liverpool. We've got another number of things we're looking at. We've got another scheme in planning, but we always, uh, wherever we are, we always have an open book approach. Um, we collaborate with the investor, with the managing agents, with the architects, with everybody involved has got sight of what we're doing so it's very clean and transparent and honest so yeah in answer to the question it's not um dissuading investors i think what's really positive is those issues have been brought to the fore and they're being dealt with and they're now being dealt with swiftly and i think to show that that action has been taken is a really positive story as well it shows that you know um the the authority means business so um you'll always get you know the 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 negative or the sensational news will always get the headlines it, it obviously will but there's so many good news stories there as well um that yeah it doesn't really affect significantly the um, investors sort of um view of the city once you, you you can get opportunity to talk to them and obviously the people we're talking to aren't put off by it at all they see it as an opportunity yeah, thank you. Matt, is that something that you would you would ag agree with talking to investors lots? Yeah, I don't, I you know, honestly don't think it matters at all, you know, um, schemes fail um, and every, you know, there is, you know, most developers would, you know, wouldn't develop if they didn't think they were better than the next developer, otherwise <laughs> who'd take the risk? Um, you know, it wasn't that long ago that Manchester had a massive overhang of the wrong sort of residential stock and, and yeah, housing developers called it wrong um, and, and will. Uh, I think it's, you know, you've got to have the courage to build. And I'm afraid, you know, moving from a, what's it going to take moving from a, not a secondary city, because I don't think Liverpool is a secondary city, but moving from a secondary investment location to a primary investment location does involve local investors and developers being prepared to take risk. And I often come back to thinking, well, who's the ask or the brunt word or the allied London who took those big risks on Manchester coming, you know, post, post the bomb, uh, you know, massive risks. Um, and it came through, but they delivered the kind of stock that people wanted to work and live in. They delivered stuff that was big enough that institutional investors wanted to buy them. And without that local courage, as it always, I think, does come from the local community, um, you're not going to move, you know, the city isn't going to move up a division. Um, and some will fail, you know, that, that's inherently part of risk. If it, if, it, if it was, if property development didn't involve failure, then, um, you know, everyone would do it. Yeah. And, you know, we don't get better if we don't fail. You can't learn if you get it right the whole time. Uh, um, moving on to a, another question. And Matt, uh, Mark, I'm going to um, direct this one to, to you to start with. Um, so this is, does the panel consider that the wider city region understands what investors are looking for, i.e. specific investment product, a plan and a time scale? Most investors have a sophisticated set of hurdles for any investment location or criteria. Can the region satisfy these hurdles going forward? Thank you. I was hoping you were going to ask me the public transport question because I know how to answer that one. <laughs> I'll ask you that one as well, don't worry. I, I'm not sure what our questioner means by the wider city region. You see, uh, who, who does our questioner mean? 
I do not know. Maybe, well, let's just take it as the city or, or uh, city and surround, surrounding areas, maybe, but just take it from the, the city for now. Okay. Um, <clears throat> if you can. I find that one difficult to, I find that, that, that one difficult to answer. Look, look, there's, there's definitely something about pace in the city region and, and, and not enough projects coming forward quickly enough. I think we can see that. Um, there's something about um, clarity over where, where we're going to build in the city and what for, but I think Tony Reeves has been brilliant in identifying those areas around like the knowledge quarter, the partnership with Scientech, which is Brumwood LNG, and the aspirations for the for the hill and the, and, and the knowledge quarter, uh, which which feature heavily in our recovery plans and, and our CSR submission. Um, and, and without further specifics, I'd rather just answer the transport question. Okay, we'll come back yeah. to the, we'll come back to the transport. Oh, I'll, um, I'll, I'll just make a point. Sorry, oh, on that, Matt, if sorry. I may, but just I think you know, was it in, um, I think I would say. The city is capable of answering those questions better in my opinion than it ever has been before it may not be perfect but it's definitely answering these questions better than it ever has done before and that's a massive step forward from when i started in the 80s and 90s thanks Matt. so if, if um sam i'll kind of make a um uh this is not directed exclusively at liverpool um, so just kind of a generic statement, but the work of my team on the project side of it in engaging with kind of local project promoters around the UK, one of the biggest challenges that they've got is kind of political imperative to be um, to be engaging and, and kind of uh, driving growth and development while also having a credible pipeline of opportunities. And I think the por a significant proportion of the time that we spend as a team is actually kind of really testing the proposition as to whether or not something is ready uh, for for investment, and I think um, that kind of clearly honed list of opportunities that people in in the city and, and the wider region are prepared to back and promote internationally, and make sure that that actually happens to deliver is absolutely fundamental. As opposed to kind of um, here are, here is a wish list of things that we might want to do. I think to be compelling in an international context, whether or not it's at a MIPM or whether or not it's on a one to one uh, um, engagement with investors is about kind of really knowing at what stage a particular project is and being able to commit to it and give the investor the confidence that uh, if the, um, uh, the the virtual checkbook is ready to, to be signed, that there is a project that will actually be, um, that is ready to roll off the back of it. And I think um, uh, accepting the point that Matt made, I think there is, uh, there is sometimes a disconnect between opportunity and, and, and reality. And I think making sure more projects are kind of uh, are being promoted that are ready for investment in those conversations with institutional investors makes it a lot more compelling and a lot more likelihood that those uh, uh, discussions will progress. Thanks, Kevin. Um, Mark, I've got a great question for you. <laughs> it's about public transport. Uh, here it comes. Uh, Liverpool lacks public the public transport that Lon London and Manchester possess, uh, even though we set the standards in the past, says, uh, says Alan. Uh, and parking is expensive. Does the panel believe that these are credible criticism holding back investment? And if so, how do we correct it? Thanks very much for the question. <clears throat> um, Liverpool has the most popular commuter train network in the country and the most popular or the top three most popular bus network in the country. <clears throat> so Liverpool's transport problems are not universal. Does it? So, so if you're here already, you'll perceive a really good public transport system. The challenge we have is that to get to Manchester is unacceptably difficult and to get to London is unacceptably infrequent. But once you're here, the transport system is actually very good. And I think that there's a, there's a nuance to that problem that, that directs solutions in, in different ways. So in a, in a year or maybe a year and a half time, we, we get two trains an hour from London and not before time because the Liverpool to London route, so the London to Liverpool route is busier than the, 
uh, London to Leeds route. So do, I do, do perceive and agree with that problem. Oh, mute. Backstanding you to yourself. Okay. But, but, but not on the local level. And I'd like to, <clears throat> I'd like to take Matt's perspective, actually, whether whether that rings true in the in the discussions you have. Like we we do see it as a barrier to investment from London out, but we don't see it as a barrier to investment locally or overall. I think. Um, I used to think good connections to London was really really important. Um, I'm not that convinced, actually. Um, when I look at other cities, you know that there is this sort of let's put the scheme as close as possible to the station that connects to London because it'll be visible and it's a bit like saying I need to have my office near Heathrow and you question the company on how many of their staff travel regularly and they go well, it's just the board and you go well do you really need to that um, it is all about local for me and I also I mean maybe maybe I'm wrong but if, if if the new normal remains the new normal the last six months have told us one thing about public transport is that people hate commuting so spending vast amounts of money on improving commuting infrastructure could well be a big mistake Shannon any any thoughts from you around around the public transport in, in Liverpool um Having, I've lived in most major cities throughout um, England, Scotland particularly, and um, lived in, in Liverpool for, for well over 10 years. And I found it and, and still find it a, a really commutable city in terms of the Mersey Rail network, in terms of the bus network. Um, cycling, I, I would say, if, if you're not cycling along the waterfront, I think... It, could be a little bit hairy so I think that would be something interesting to look at if when we're as I say we're looking now or our funds are looking more towards suburban green single family um, rental locations and cycle routes are definitely up there um, it's the first thing we look at I, I look at two things when looking at suburban now it's cycle routes and green space even if it sounds really morbid even if it's a cemetery you know I'll class that as you know somewhere to go and walk and you know just just take a break from from a city um so for me I, i've and investors that we speak to liverpool is seen as um locally a, a good city for getting around and um I, I would just agree to to get that connection i think the the i think there's a one or two trains from Victoria into Manchester, which you can get to Manchester for 38 minutes. I'd like to see a lot more of them. They're absolutely packed. People are standing in the toilets before it gets to the next stop. I think that definitely needs to be looked at as we talk about the Northwest region and people choosing where they live and moving around the region. Um, and yeah, the, 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 the connection to, to London, but I think as, as Zoom, Zoom has arrived, I think Avanti have probably got their head in their hands. <laughs> I think it'll be interesting as well when it going forward in a in a post COVID and in a climate focused world whether um, cycle infrastructure and and waterway infrastructure becomes um, a bit more of a, a appeal to investors than perhaps um, road infrastructure and, and rail infrastructure and probably a bit of a long way off yet but um, as a cyclist I can I can but dream. Yeah. Um, we have um, two minutes left. We might go over by one minute. They might let me. Um, and there is um, one question from the audience left. And um, then I would like us to, to finish up on, on a final question to you all as well. So last question from the audience uh, is that world heritage status is a particular marker for Liverpool. Yet has been put into question by some doubtful developments. How can growth and heritage be harmonized for optimum, optimum benefit. Sorry, that's a hard sentence to, to read. Um, Matt, any thoughts from you? Um, well, if anyone's got the answer to it, pretty much every city on the planet is asking the same question. So um, I think I would say, you know, view what you're building now as the city's future heritage, and you're probably starting from the right place. It's a bit trite, but. Um, 
you know, some people hate new buildings, some people hate old buildings, it's never going to be satisfied. But, um, you know, the city has a great heritage. I mean, beyond the built environment, um, the city has an amazing heritage. Um, and, you know, that is part of the sales package. But if we, I suspect the questioner was asking about the built environment, and they probably don't like new buildings. Uh, you know, but look, you know that you know today's today's new build is tomorrow's heritage. We hope. Thank you, Mark. Any thoughts? Nothing more sage than what Mark offered. <laughs> Fantastic. Okay, so uh, we're dead on three thirty now. So I just want to. Want to take us back um, to the to the title of, of today's session, actually, and just for for a last uh, question or, or thought from all of you, I suppose, on on how you think Liverpool should, could, and will um, sort of seize on promoting the opportunities that there are for investment in it. And I'm going to start with you, Shannon. Yeah. Um, so again, I mean, this is um, from a, a residential perspective. I think that there's already an awful lot of interest, and I think the past six months have generated even more interest in the city. And I think it's just about harnessing that interest now, and really promoting what Liverpool can offer. Um, getting people on a train <laughs> and up to Liverpool. I think you know you, you, you don't need to do anything else, but it's really yeah. showing yeah. that. that that live and work. Um, it's the opposite of the donut, I would say, uh, donut effect that we're seeing in, in London because it genuinely is the centre and surrounds. It's a 15 minute city and I think it's about getting that message across. Um, it's, it's a great place to live and there's opportunities there to work or use it as a base to work, you know, in other parts of the UK. Fantastic. Thank you. Gavin. Um, I think we need to bottle the enthusiasm we've heard on the call and um, uh, alongside the vision that has been clearly articulated as part of the recovery plan and other pieces of work and just make sure that we're amplifying that to the world because there's so many positives that have been articulated today. Um, uh, we'd love to support you on, on doing that from, from a central government perspective. So the, the energy and the enthusiasm, we need to amplify it. Fantastic. Thanks, Gavin. Matt? Um, I think clarity on what the city is great at and what it wants to be great at is really important. I think Gavin made a great point earlier saying that don't try to be everything for everyone. Um, and I think you know, it's definitely it feels like it's moving in the right way. And then I think, you know, the city's got, you know, the city and its community and its businesses has got to be bold. And I guess I would say this, it's got to build. Um, because if you don't build stuff for people to buy, they won't come and buy it. Thanks, Matt. Mark, last but by no means least. Thank you. Focusing on our strengths, which in our case means starting with our people. Excellent. Thank you. So some really good, really good takeaways there. So bottle the enthusiasm that we've, that we've had in this, this um, conversation today and really turn up the volume on that. Be clear on, on what you want. Uh, be bold, build. And uh, and focus focus on 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 the people as well. And then I think um, there is a name for the opposite of the donut, isn't there? I think you can buy like the donut holes, which are delicious, uh, and uh, and and Liverpool is delicious too. So let's all let's all uh, end there with a sweet tooth and probably now a little bit hungry. But thank you so much, everyone, for for joining us today. And huge thanks to Shannon, Mark, Matt, and Gavin. Thanks, Anne. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.